minus that in a reference material as a proportion of the ratio in the reference material. Now this notation has been used for 70 years now. The numbers uh, are very small, so we generally report them in parts per thousand or per mil. The second thing I need to say is that um, certainly at the time this paper was published, it was believed that all chemical and physical processes fractionated the oxygen isotopes in such a way that the delta 17 value would be half or very close to half of the delta 18 O value. This is what's known as mass dependent fractionation. And we'll be referring to this later on in the talk, as I'm sure many other talks will be in this presentation. So what um, Professor Robert Clayton and his um, colleagues at the University of Chicago did, well, first of all, they measured um, a load of terrestrial samples, terrestrial rocks and waters, lunar soils, and as expected, everything fitted on a line of slope a half, which you would expect on a delta 17O versus delta 18 O plot if this mass dependent relationship holds. I should say that if uh, these terrestrial samples were measured nowadays, the pre precision is so much better that everything would fit on one regression line and you would see no deviation from it. Second thing to note is that all these measurements were made using carbon dioxide as the analyte gas rather than oxygen. Um, Bob Clayton actually in the mid 1950s convert, started converting all his oxygen to CO2 for the measurements. So um, that's pretty impressive really. Now, what he, he and his colleagues discovered was that in carbonaceous uh, meteorites, there were anhydrous high temperature inclusions that didn't fit the expected pattern, this mass dependent line. Instead, they fitted on a line of slope one. In other words, the delta 17 O values were the same as the delta 18 O values. Now, there was no way that this could possibly be due to a, um, a, a chemical process, or so it was thought at the time. And so they, they suggested that it must have been due to nuclear processes. Right, well, the, the next big paper in this story was published 10 years later, when that fractionation line of slope one was reproduced in a chemical reaction in the laboratory by Professor Mark Themans and his colleague John Heidenreich. This was the first demonstration of a chemically produced so-called mass independent isotopic fractionation. In other words, it doesn't fit with the mass dependent expectation. And the reaction involved the generation of ozone uh, from molecular oxygen by electrical discharge. And what we see here is that the ozone, ah, sorry, back one. Uh, that's the one I want. Yeah, the ozone is enriched in the minor isotopes and the residual oxygen is depleted in the minor isotopes. And the, slope, and the line has a slope of one. Now, it was then discovered this wasn't just a laboratory curiosity in that ozone in the stratosphere is also characterized by mass independent 17O enrichment, as is carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. And in the troposphere, we find that ozone is unusually enriched in 17O. And over the years, it's been shown, in fact, that most oxygen bearing constituents of the atmosphere have mass independently fractionated oxygen. And this uh, plot illustrates that. This is from one of Mark's papers in 2013. And basically it shows that um, 17 hour enrichment can be transferred either directly or indirectly from stratospheric ozone into numerous oxygen bearing constituents of the atmosphere. And of course there's a stratospheric tropospheric exchange and as a result, CO2 ent entering the troposphere can then experience successive isotopic exchange with water and this reduces and may eventually eliminate that mass independent signal. And because of the production of ozone by photochemistry acting on molecular oxygen in the stratosphere, followed by stratospheric tropospheric exchange, 
This means that the residual tropospheric O2 is depleted in 170 relative to mass dependent composition. And we can quantify that, although we haven't defined the terminology here, just note that it's a non-zero number. It's not obvious at the scale of this figure, but actually tropospheric oxygen is the largest terrestrial mass independent isotopic res reservoir. What about in the, the rock record? Well, the first discovery was made by uh, Hui Ming Bao and his colleagues. Um, and basically, there are examples known now, several others have been found, of rocks or minerals characterized by mass independent oxygen isotopic compositions. They tend to be sulfates or nitrates from desert environments, either hot deserts or cold deserts, such as the, the Antarctic. And modeling indicates that these unusual isotopic compositions can be traced to photochemical reactions in the stratosphere or the troposphere. Let's look at the mass fractionation laws in a bit more detail. So the, here we have the, uh, the natural abundance of the three isotopes. Oxygen 17, of course, is the, uh, is the least abundant by, it's a factor of about 5.3, less abundant than oxygen 18. And it was uh, noted by Harmon Craig back in 1957. I'll read this out. For systems in thermodynamic equilibrium, consideration of the vibrational frequency decrease for the addition of one and of two neutrons to a nucleus indicates that the fractionation factor for the distribution of 17O between two compounds should be the square root of the fractionation factor for 18O. So it, it, it's actually a power law rather than a linear relationship. And, and therefore we have this uh, relationship between alpha 17 and alpha 18 where the, uh, the exponent we designate as theta. Originally, that was set to a value of, of a half, but actually it's not quite a half and it will vary according to the, the actual identity of the reactants, A and B. And those can be phases, liquid vapor as well. And it's also dependent to a, a small extent on temperature. And theta has a high temperature limit value um, for gas phase equilibrium exchange with atomic oxygen, a, a value of 0 0.5305 for all oxygen bearing molecules. And that value can be derived from the simple expression here, uh, where the little m's are the respective masses of the three stable isotopes. For other equilibrium exchanges, the value of theta depends on the specific reaction and varies slightly with temperature. And the first measurement of theta that I'm aware of was made in 1970. Keep pressing the wrong, sorry, keep pressing the wrong button. Control, there we go. Was, was made in 1978 by Matsuhisa et al. of quart, the quartz water system at 250 degrees. And then much more recently, in the past few years, there've been measurements made of CO2 water, again, quartz water, biogen, bio, genic appetite water and the, the pattern generally is that at lower temperatures you get lower values of theta at higher temperatures such as in granite mantle prototype systems you get much higher values of theta um, kinetic processes can be considered using a similar type of formalism um, this was looked at by big Lyson and big Lyson and Wolfsburg in the in the 1950s and then more recently, Ed Young uh, published this expression for theta based on the, the masses of the uh, isotopically substituted molecules. And we can see that on this basis, theta would vary from just over a half to 0 0.516. And the higher limit value applies to atomic ops oxygen. The lower limit refers to uh, in infinite mass. Right, um, so after the paper of Clayton et al, 1973, Bob Clayton was also um, co-author on this paper by Matsuhisa et al, 1978, where they considered this power law relationship in more detail. And for an individual reactant such as CO2, water, quartz, etc., we have this power law relationship. 
between the delta values. And of course, 1 plus delta 70O is simply 70O over 16O. These calculations were based on the theoretical framework published by Harold Urey in 1947. And Matsuhisa et al. calculated that for various exchange reactions, theta would, would vary from 0.52 to 0.528. Now, for small fractionations, you can approximate that power law using the McLaren expansion of log of one plus X, so that we now have a linear relationship between delta 17 and delta 18. And the proportionality chose, uh, value chosen of 0.52 was chosen on the basis of, uh, of it being a reasonable compromise between theoretical calculations and empirical observations for the quartz water system. And on the three isotope plot, where we plot delta 17O against delta 18O, we can actually plot the samples, any samples that deviate from that uh, reference fractionation line of slope 0.52, can, we, we can actually quantify with this parameter big delta 17O, which is simply any inequality between the two sides of this, this, this equation here. So this famous equation, big delta 17O equals little delta 17O minus 0.52 delta 18O has been used routinely since 1988 um, in the field of um, meteoritics and also for identifying and quantifying mass independent isotope effects in terrestrial samples. Right, for, for any uh, collection of uh, rocks, waters, gases of diverse origin with a range of delta 18 values, again, we have a power law relationship. But here we're using a different uh, designator. We're using lambda because we don't know exactly what processes have taken place in the samples. And we have an additional term here, the gamma. And when we convert this, this into... Um, linear relationship here. The gamma simply refers to the, any offset of the resulting sample data array from the zero point of the delta scale. And the slope is given by, by lambda. A couple of points to note, delta is it's dimensionless. It doesn't have units of per mil. Per mil is not a unit. And deltas are of small magnitude. So we report delta value of uh, 10 per mil it's actually got an absolute magnitude of 0 0.01. And it's the absolute magnitude number that you have to plug into these equations. Second point is that for a diverse collection of samples, the oxygen triple isotope compositions are defined by the respective exchange histories, which are not usually known of the individual samples. So now, again, similar to before, we can quantify the magnitude of the delta 17 as the difference between those two sides of the equation. And in the literature, the term terrestrial fractionation line appears quite a lot. And it's usually defined from measurements of a collection of samples, but it, it should be recognized there is no single definitive terrestrial fractionation line because the slope and the offset will depend upon the, the samples that are included in the analysis. It's very useful if everybody would perhaps uh, standardize on reference uh, reference line. And one beauty of this, of the equation is that you don't have to use an empirical uh, reference line. You can actually define it arbitrarily. So here we've, we've uh, got RL to show that we've defined the slope of the reference line and likewise the offset, gamma RL. Or, in the shorthand notation, instead of writing log, open brackets, etc., we can just use the prime symbol. And, and, and this, this basically encaps, encapsulates the definition of cap delta 17, or big delta 17. So on the basis of the uh, logarithmic version of the three i state plot, we now have, again, cap delta prime 17O is the difference between the sample points and the reference line. And unlike the original definition, our new definition doesn't vary with the isotopic composition of the reference material, nor with the delta 18O range of the samples. 
And an increasingly common convention, as recommended in this short course, is to report the delta prime 17O data with a reference line of slope 0.528 and zero offset. And if possible, calibrate the data to the VSMO slap scale. And on that scale, slap has, is defined to have a cap delta 17O of zero. The accuracy of the data still depends very much on the accuracy of calibrating the little delta values to the working standard O2 um, relative to a reference material, which is usually VSMO, Vienna Standard Mean Ocean Water. And ideally, one should correct for the instrumental compression of the delta scale by measurements of oxygen extracted from uh, a depleted reference material such as slap. Right, now because delta 17 and delta 18 no values and their respective measurement or errors are correlated because of the mass dependent fractionation relationship, we can determine big delta 17 no values to higher accuracy and precision than the associated little delta values. And we can now get down to about five PPM or even better. And high precision measurements are usually made using oxygen gas um, extracted from silicates by infrared laser assisted fluorination, which was introduced by Zach Sharp in 1990. I, he's giving a presentation later on, I believe. And BRF5 or fluorine are used as, as the fluorinating agents. And over the past 30 years, there have been refinements to the details of the fluorination procedure and the O2 purification procedures. And these have been largely responsible for the improvements in the precision of silicate big delta 17O determinations. For individual collections of silicate rocks and minerals, you can get slopes of roughly in the region of 0.522 to 0.529. And of course, the theta values that are generally associated with low temperature exchanges, such as sedimentary examples with waters, and high temperature rock assemblages are characterized by highest theta values. If you get a very large number of samples representing a diversity of rocks and mineral types, you tend to get a fairly average theta value of 0.525. I think in Göttingen, over 1,100 samples were used to, to produce a number of 0.5251. And as my colleague Andreas has uh, already said, this um, probably represents the mean isotopic fractionation between melts, minerals, and aqueous fluids at various temperatures and pressures. And interestingly enough, it's quite close to the value of 0.526 that was determined by Matsuhisa et al. all those years ago. Um, Andres has also pointed out to me that, that because low temperature processes are associated with larger 18O, 16O fractionations, such samples may disproportionately control the slope of the regression array, even if you have many high temperature samples there. Now, a big challenge we have at the moment is to actually uh, produce standards which everybody agrees on the big delta 17 O value of. And San Carlos Olivine is a, is a widely used standard. It's a mantle silicate proxy. And there have been fairly recently uh, one, two, th three laboratories have come up with completely different big delta 17 O numbers for. San Carlos Olivine. Well, I say completely different. We're, we're looking at PPM scale here, but between minus 36 and minus 58 um, PPM. And, and the same is true, really, in that there's no agreement on the, uh, or no consensus, I should say, to within five PPM or so on the big delta 17 O values of other silicate standards, such as the University of Wisconsin Garnet and NBS 28 uh, silica sand. So we need further research into find out what's going on here. Um, I think we're, we're obviously uh, in a much better place than we were a few years ago and progress is being made. What about waters? Um, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. I think I've still got a few minutes left. Well, <laughs> for waters, again, we have a power law relationship rather similar to that of silicates. This was first shown by, by Mayer and Lee back in 1998. Where, where the slope of the line, and we again, we're using lambda rather than theta because there's a whole variety of processes going on here. 
where the slope is 0.5281. And this was subsequently confirmed at much higher precision by the laboratory of um, Boaz Luz and colleagues in Jerusalem. Um, it was since discovered that if you actually take away the, the polar samples, I mean, the, these, are un, these are Antarctic samples here, and these samples are from Greenland, you actually successively reduce the slope. So it's not actually really a global line. Um, in much of the literature, there's the terminology 170 excess. And that is basically identical to big delta 17O as we've defined it in this short course. So the terms are essentially interchangeable using the slope of 0.528 for the definition. Um, back in 2004, it was predict predicted on theoretical grounds that this, um, this array would not actually go through the, the zero point of the delta scale simply because um, as a result of kinetic fractionation during the diffusive transport of water vapor from the ocean surface into unsaturated air. And it was suggested that um, the normalized relative humidity at the vapor source largely controls and inversely correlates with the magnitude of Big Del 17O if you take into account turbulence in the marine boundary layer. But nobody could actually test those predictions at the time because there just wasn't the capability of measuring big delta 17 to within 5 ppm. But that was achieved the following year by um, the Jerusalem Laboratory. So they optimized the water fluorination procedure using uh, cobalt trifluoride. And more recently, spectroscopic techniques have uh, started to become online. And these don't require any chemical processing or mass spectrometry. And the attainable precision is, is approaching that now of the, the Barkan and Luz fluorination method. Um, the origin of the non-zero big delta 17 O value in meteoric waters. Well, um, Bar uh, Barkan and Luz suggested that it was basically due to the, uh, the difference between theta for water vapor diffusion in air, which they, they measured as 0.5185 and their water vapor liquid equilibrium value of 0.529. Um, I should point out that this, this, this measurement here, made in 2005, is, is, is as far as I know, the first uh, theta measurement of the, shall we say, the modern era since, um, since the 1978 measurement of qu the quartz water system was made. Anyway, the, the explanation by Barkan and Luz was, uh, was very much in accord with um, that originally proposed by Angert et al, although the relevant fractionate, fractionation factors were not accurately known in 2004. And there's been um, experimental confirmation uh, in 2010 and more recently, 2019, that there is a negative correlation between big delta 17O of waters and the normalized relative humidity. Right, um, I guess I must be- About two minutes. Two minutes, right, well, that's fine. Uh, just to mention very, very briefly, there are a paragraph in each, there's seven examples quote, given on the application of triple oxygen isotope ratio measurements, um, lunar versus terrestrial comparisons, reconstructing the climate of snowball earth. This is work done by my co-author and his, his team in Göttingen. Um, quantifying the crustal components in ocean island basalts uh, from triple isotope ratio measurements of olivine. This is done by Cal et al. Quantifying gross photosynthetic oxygen production in the oceans. This was first suggested uh, 20 years ago using the big delta 17O distinction between dissolved O2 of atmospheric origin and that produced by photosynthesis. Constraints on the emergence of continents by measurements on shales. Ilya Bindeman is going to be talking about this later on. Likewise, insights into weathering processes from big delta 17 O measurements of fluvial sediments. And last, but by no means least, measurements of fossil tooth enamel to reconstruct atmospheric partial pressures of CO2 during the Cenozoic 
and across the Paleocene Eocene transition. So again, for further information, this is the uh, this is the book to uh, to consult. I think I'd better stop there now so that the, there's time for any questions and uh, say thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Martin, for your your um, overview talk on um, applications and the history on on triple auction isotope measurements. Are there any questions? Um, and any questions in the chat? Or... No, there are no questions in the chat. Okay. I I, I guess it's um, because it's an overview. Then uh, it, maybe it's not specific enough to raise questions on. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just have a question. It's, it's what is your perspective? Do you think that the that the laser um, spectroscopy for water, maybe also CO two, is going to be the technique of the future and will, uh, you know, uh, outcompete with the mass spectrometry? Well, it's it's certainly a lot. E it's a lot more convenient, isn't it? And mm. I suppose it has the advantage you can take it out into the, into the field as well, into um, difficult environments such as um, the Antarctic. And yeah, I think um, it probably will be much more widely used now that um, I, I think it's getting down to about seven parts per million at the, oh, um, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I think your, your, your former student Magdalena Hoffman told me that um, last okay. year. Maybe it's even better yeah. now. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe the authors could, uh, not authors, uh, uh, participants can also email questions and put them in the chat and we'll make them available for speakers uh, okay. later. So that would be maybe a good practice. If you think of something interesting to ask, uh, feel free to send questions to chat uh, and we'll uh, make them known. 